Okay, we're recording. I'm calling the uh, October 2021 meeting of the Trails, Sidewalks, and Bikeways Committee to or, uh, to order at uh, 7:10 p.m. on the 13th of October. I'm going to start by reading the uh, recitals so that we can document the fact that we're holding this meeting electronically and to uh, put into position, put into play the emergency procedures authorized, authorized by Virginia FOIA and the emergency ordinance. The committee needs to make certain findings and recommendations and determinations for its record. First item, audibility of members' voices. First, because each member of this committee is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that a member's voice is clear, audible, and at an appropriate volume for all the other members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each committee member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay attention to ensure that you can hear each of your colleagues as they answer. Following the roll call, we'll vote on, uh, we'll vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. So I will start out. Uh, I'm Bob Cosgriff. I'm the Braddock District Representative and the Vice Chair. I'm chairing this meeting. And I'm calling from my home in Hickory Farms in Fairfax. Hunter District. Alex Ruff. Alex Rowe, that is. <clears throat> Mount Vernon District. Jim Klein. This is Jim Klein calling from my home in uh, Mount Vernon area. Thank you. Uh, Drainsville. Wade Smith. Uh, this is Wade Smith calling from my home in the Drainsville District in McLean. Mason District, James Albright. This is James Albright calling from my home in the Mason District of Fairfax County. Springfield District, Carl Liebert. Lee District, Dayami Pipkin. Sully District, Karen Ampe. Clifton Horse Society, Katie McDaniel. This is Katie McDaniel calling from my home in Oak Hill. Thank you, Katie. Uh, Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling, Sean Newman. <clears throat> this is Jeff Anderson uh, sitting in for Sean Newman calling from my home in Oakton for Fairfax Alliance for Better Bicycling. Thanks, Jeff. Welcome back. <laughs> yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. Fairfax Area Disability Services Board, Debbie Cohen. Fairfax Federation of Citizens Associations, Mark Tipton. Uh, I know Mark sent me an email earlier that he was not going to be able to attend today. Thank you. Fairfax County Park Authority, Beth Ionetta. This is Beth Ionetta calling from my home in the city of Fairfax. Northern Virginia Builders Industry Association. Soledad Portillo. Northern Virginia Regional Park Authority, that's vacant, as is Providence District. Washington Area Bicyclist Association, Howard Elbers. Howard Elbers, and I'm calling from my home in Fairfax via a telephone line. And I will be the note taker for tonight. Yes, thank you, Howard. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of this committee. It's our practice to approve this and all subsequent motions by acclamation. So I'll ask now if there are any objections or nay votes to the motion. Hearing none, the motion carries. Second, having established that each member's voice can be heard by each other member, we will next establish the nature of the emergency that, com that compels these emergency procedures, the fact that we're meeting electronically, what type of electronic communications are being used, and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic 
makes it unsafe for this committee to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such, the FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of this committee and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this committee may conduct this meeting electronically through the Cisco WebEx video conferencing platform. This format may, will also provide a dedicated phone line. The public may access this meeting by going to the fairfax.webex.com and entering the event number 2338-164-8275 and the password TRAILS2021 or by calling 1-844-621-3956 and using the access code 2338-164-8275. It is so moved. I will again ask if there are any objections or nay votes. Hearing none, the motion carries. Finally, it is necessary to require or to establish that all the matters addressed on today's agenda address the emergency itself are necessary for continuity in the Fairfax County Government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of this committee's lawful purposes, duties and responsibilities. It is so moved. I will again ask if there are any objections or nay votes. Hearing none, the motion carries. Okay, thank you. Now we'll move on to uh, the uh, next item on the agenda, which is the review and approval of prior minutes. And uh, I'm going to let Beth Ionetta, the secretary, lead this, and she'll tell you what we're going to approve and how we're going to do it. Beth, go ahead. So, sorry, if I could just uh, jump in real quick, um, just to, to go around to make sure um, what we got um, the other attendees. Um, so also a note, uh, just for, for, out, or for Howard's sake, taking the minutes, uh, Karen, Ampe, and Alex Rowe um, have logged in a bit late. Uh, my apologies to everyone for the password confusion. Um, also, so I'm, of course, David Loss from Fairfax County DOT. Uh, Lauren Del Mar is also here from FCDOT. Um, and we have a, a, a couple additional guests. Uh, Phil Camelor, I hope I said that right, from the Fairfax, uh, Fairfax Family for Safe Streets. And uh, Lieutenant Jason Long uh, from FCPD. Um, so thank you to you all for attending as well. Sorry to cut you off. Yeah, and David, I just see that Carl uh, joined us as well. So maybe we can get a mic check with Carl and uh, Alex and Karen. Hey everyone, uh, Alex Rowe from the Hunter Mill District. Carl, is Carl there? And Karen is from home. Karen Abe from Sully. Yes, Carl Ebertson from Springfield. Oh, there you are. Okay, great. Okay, I think we all heard each of the new uh, attendees speak. Uh, if anybody didn't hear them speak, let me know. Okay. Uh, Beth, you want to go ahead and start the process for reviewing the minutes? Sure. Good evening, everybody. Um, just to recap, last month we reviewed the set of minutes that covered 2020 me meetings that we had. Um, I have sent out the following for 2021. January, February, March, April, May, and June. They were sent out via uh, email to you all on September 9th. Hopefully you were able to receive them. Um, I have not received any comments on them. So if you have any comments to make changes or, or edits, please let me know. Hearing and seeing nothing, I will assume they are good to go. So I will make a motion to approve the minutes from January through June 2021. January through June 2021, okay? Can I get a Is second? A sec yeah, we need a second. Second. 
Thanks, Wade. Are we doing it by acclamation? Or? Beth, go ahead. Oh, I was going to defer to you on the vote um, on how we're doing it. No, you go ahead. You can, you're the secretary. You can call for the motion and the vote. Okay. Uh, so I, I call the motion. Um, anyone object? Please speak now. <laughs> Seeing and hearing none, the motion passes. Good. And okay, thank you. Now, what and what what is the plan for July through September then? Uh, July, September, and tonight's meeting will be sent out as the next batch, and we will be all cut up till uh, with our minutes. Great, thank you very much. Okay, next on the agenda is about a one hour presentation by three different people, and we're going to start that off by. Hearing from Phil Kimmelor from the Fairfax Families for Safe Streets, and he's going to talk about something that's a very high priority with this committee, which is pedestrian and bicycle safety. Thank uh, you, Phil. I'll let you start. Maybe tell us a little bit about your organization, maybe a little bit about yourself, and, and then just dive in. And will you have screen items to share with us? Um, I was actually hoping to uh, share the uh, the organization's website. So if um, I don't know if you can uh, turn the uh, presentation, uh, uh, I just made you the presenter, so you should be able to share your screen. Right, let's see. Mm -hmm. Let's see how that's going to go. I'm only seeing that I can share my event window, if not my web browser. Uh, um, not super sure. I'll take it away and give it back to you. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Well, you know, WebEx is very temperamental, always. So it may not cooperate. Oh, it says now I'm the presenter. Okay, let's try that again. Let's see if that helps. Now it's still only saying I can share my event window, but uh, let's see what that might help me do here. All right, if you click the, so when you hit the share button at the bottom there, it didn't, Come up with anything but the well, I was look I was using I was using I was only seeing that I had it on the top uh the top navigation so I was uh it I don't my share the share button on the bottom is not active for me I, it's uh, it's grayed out let's uh, see if that works well um why don't you put a link in the chat and I can share it um, okay. and you can just have me navigate around. Sure. Sounds like a good idea. Okay. Well, that's happening. I have a, an item in the chat. Uh, we have a, a guest here who identifies himself as a Boy Scout attending a public meeting for a merit badge. So welcome to our meeting and uh, hopefully you'll enjoy hearing these presentations on uh, pedestrian and bicycle safety that are about to commence. Okay, there we go. Okay, thanks. Thanks, David. Much appreciated. So, um, I'm with uh, Fairfax Families for Safe Streets. Um, I live in Mason District and uh, I joined this organization um, some months ago because it was uh, focused on safety for both cyclists and pedestrians, the organization is relatively new. Um, it was founded by Mike Doyle, an Alexandria resident in 2017, after he was um, struck by a car a, as he was crossing, a, a, as he was in a crosswalk in Alexandria and seriously injured. And uh, 
he was, you know, he, he kind of channeled that experience into establishing first um, a chapter in Alexandria and then since expanding the organization to uh, Arlington and Fairfax County. Uh, Fairfax Families for Safe Streets and the, the other uh, organizations are part of what we call the North Virginia Families for Safe Streets. And we're affiliated with a, a national organization called Families for Safe Streets, which was, which was started in New York City and now is a national organization that has chapters all over the country. Uh, the, the organization itself is a community-based volunteer organization. And so our, as, you know, the mission that we, that we see ourselves having is doing what we can to create streets that are safe for walking and for biking. And it's through the presentation of crashes caused by motor vehicles. We don't see incidents between vehicles pedestrians and cyclists as accidents, we see them as crashes that can be avoided. And so when we think about, uh, when we think about, you know, tragedies that happen, we think they can be avoided either through changes in infrastructure, education and advocacy. Um, we're advocates and supporters of vision zero policies. And, and we'd like to see Fairfax County adopt a vision zero commitment just as, Alex, as Alexandria, Arlington, and Washington, D.C. have done. Uh, the kinds of things, uh, the kinds of, if you just, let's like, say, using uh, the top navigation, I, you know, we do a lot of education. So if you click on the education tab, I can talk about that for a minute. We have guidelines for drivers. We also have guidelines for pedestrians, uh, which, you know, we like to share out to different community groups, such as PTOs, community organizations, you know, just to help spread the word. The guide for pedestrians, if you scroll all the way to the bottom, we have um, created different flyers that we like to we distribute as we can uh, so that pedestrians know how to cross the street around Fairfax County because it's not straightforward. There's not crosswalks all everywhere. And even where there are, it's still, you need to be aware of what's going on. We have an English version and a Spanish version. And we try to get these out to the community as, as we can. Uh, you know, we just have a simple stop, look and wave type of, uh, you know, type of mantra that we want people to, to use, whether they're crossing at a crosswalk or crossing at a corner, being aware that there's places where they're not it's not so easy to cross safely in a lot of places, but we understand that pedestrians also need to do what they can to, uh, to be safe. Um, we have meetings uh, once a month on the first Mondays of every month, and uh, people are all welcome to, to join those. Some of the, one of the other initiatives that we've been working on, and I wanna spend a few minutes on this, if you can scroll over to the, um, back to the, um, the, the uh, if you go back to the homepage, fair, uh, just click on the, yeah. If you scroll down, I wanna just uh, take a few minutes to talk about this near miss um, data that you, you see here. We have been, um, we've created what we call the near miss application. And it's an opportunities for pedestrians and cyclists and even drivers to report on a, a near miss incident where there's no crash, but there could be. So if you go back to the uh, home page, um, I just want to show you what this looks like. Keep, if you keep scrolling down, you'll see um, a heat map. Keep keep going. Right here. So you you see this visual here is where um, this is where near misses have been reported by um, most, mostly pedestrians, uh, where maybe a car has run a stop sign, maybe a car is going too fast, 
but really the result is someone could have been hit by a car and they weren't. So they can report it into the uh, into the reporting instrument. If you click now, if you click on the um, the near miss survey um, tab at the top of the page, and then scroll down and click on this the location survey. You can enter the information about the near miss very quickly. Um, this is also available, you know, as a, a mobile website, so you can input the information there. It takes about 30 seconds to put in all this information. And then it goes into a, um, a GIS database that was, uh, was created with the help of Virginia Tech um, GIS uh, graduate program, who's been working with us on uh, on the on the application itself, on doing the analysis and so forth, and so this is something that we are continuing to evolve. In fact, we have an application in to get a grant to um, to put this survey into uh, into a Spanish language version, but also to do more advanced analytics um, uh, on the data itself. So initially, we had a uh, uh, use treads data to um, uh, to overlay the near miss um, information to help see kind of where crashes were taking place versus where near misses were taking place, and we're looking to um, extend the functionality of the analytics to also create potential predictive analysis based on the. Uh, Based on the near miss data that's input into the, uh, you know, into this into the application. So again, we're trying to get the word out around around this as well, so that uh, we can get more data points uh, and increase the sample size uh, to uh, to help give people um, an understanding of what's going on. A few things that you know that we've also collect in this data set um, is also anecdotal commentary, uh, what people have seen or experienced when the near miss occurs. Sometimes we find that uh, people are talk, talk about a particular location in a historical sense. And so maybe something happened on a particular day, but then they'll also add that, you know, like this particular corner has been a problem for months or years. And so there's an, in addition to the uh, quantitative data set, there's a lot of qualitative data that's collected and anecdotal data that's collected that can be be helpful as well. Uh, you know, we also see we already have seen, you know, certain trends uh, such as, you know, that one of the more common reasons for the near misses um, is is uh, speed, for example, uh, and also that the highest incidence of the near misses occurs in the afternoon rush hour. Um, and then after that, it's the uh, the morning rush hour. So we're 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 pretty up, we're pretty excited about getting this off the ground. We're looking forward to getting more residents uh, to participate, so that we can, you know, build a data set uh, that that can be that we're I mean that we're 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 sharing and it can be used by local officials, transportation, law enforcement. Um, and also that the community can use. We're especially interested in making sure that um, we can slice and dice the data <laughs> to give a more uh, a more accurate view of what's really going on at this district level, so that district supervisors and their staff can see what's happening in, in their in their uh, in their their area. Um, any questions or any any uh, yeah any any. Additional information I can provide around the uh, this near miss effort and the uh, and the data we're collecting and, and analytics around it. Hey Phil, this is Jeff Anderson. Um, mm -hmm. I made comments in the chat, but um, I went over here after recently, hoping I could upload a video of mm. a near miss or three actually in my case, but I didn't see an opportunity to do that. I'm not sure that there is. But I think that would be a great that would be a great additional functionality for us to build into this, and I, I'll pass that I'll I'll pass that along. 
Okay, because I think we're finding more and more cyclists are riding with both both forward and rear facing cameras. Um, right. Uh, uh, you know, while riding, not just cell phone usage. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the. Uh, thanks for that. Bill, this is Beth Ineta with the Park Authority. Uh huh. Um, do you do you know? Maybe you don't. Um, do you only get data that relates to um, near misses with vehicles, or do you get information for, say, trail users near misses between bikes and peds, that sort of thing? Yeah, if um, I know that it's pretty that the the I know that it's the the print is fairly fairly small as it presents in the survey, but if you take a look at the survey, you can add any. Yeah, those are all possible um, data points. That you can add, so it could be a it could be a trail use a walker and a cyclist, for example, for sure. And the other question I have is, do you guys have an app, or do you have to report it through the website only? Yeah, it's not it's not a mobile app yet, but you know you could bring it up on your phone, and it presents well enough that you can create that you can input the information on the survey. Great, thanks. Thanks. So let's see. Um, so, as far as what, you know, as far as the organization itself, um, you know, I'd say that we're, as I said, we're fairly new. Um, we have a, a small group. Um, two of our board members are also in, um, in FAB and um, we're looking to increase the size of our board. We're looking to increase involvement with, um, you know, getting a volunteer, you know, volunteer, um, you know, recruiting volunteers. So that we can get more um, exposure uh, and in all the communities. Um, in addition to the the work I've been talking about, we do spend a lot of time talking to local officials, uh, you know, about uh, the you know our agenda, but also making sure that you know that they under you know that that they're aware of you know regulations, laws, you know what's going on to to help. Uh, in for, you know to help improve safety on the streets so for example one of the other things that we've you know talked about is uh you know installing cameras in school zones for example and also identifying neighborhoods that that can enact the 15 mile per hour speed limits so uh we we spend a lot of other time just uh you know kind of on the advocacy with with leadership um, both at the local county level and also at the state level as well we try to do as much um, other outreach and awareness as we can. We generate media coverage locally, you know, through hyperlocal channel channels such as the Annandale blog, Tyson's Reporter, Fairfax News, and social media. So we're um, we're doing uh, we're, we're also trying to reach audiences that that way as well. Um, so that is pretty much what i wanted to you know talk about in terms of just a high level introduction um again you can always click on our news and events tab you can see when our meetings are coming up you're always welcome to join and um hope that you hope that you will and we'll be able to continue the conversation so um, happy to answer any questions or um provide any other information uh, that, that I can right now. So I turn, turn it back over to you guys. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Phil. And before we let you go, I would just like to see if you have any success stories you could share on the basis of your education and advocacy through your group. I think that well, I think that we've had some good receptivity in the local media to hear what to hear what we have to say, um, and so I, I think that you know we're kind of getting off the ground with that. Um, the Alexandria group, um, of course, it's a little bit of a different um, government structure in Alexandria. They've been able to work pretty closely with. Um, with local um, local government, let's say, on doing things like. Um, a, crosswalk audit. So basically going around to all the crosswalks and seeing how they're set up, you know, like what kind of war let's say warnings um, are present to drivers before the crosswalk to let them know that the crosswalk's there, 
or like providing suggestions and recommendations for what crosswalks might be made um, more effective through, uh, you know, through the, the lighting and alerting to drivers and things like that. So that's something that we've talked about trying to bring into Fairfax, like an opportunity to help um, do those kinds of audits for, for crosswalks and other, other street safety um, infrastructure. Okay, does anybody on the committee have any questions for Phil? If not, thank you, Phil, for sharing your uh, information with us and uh, especially the website address and the survey form. My pleasure, thanks. Uh, the next presentation is uh, connected to the uh, issues of pedestrian and cyclist safety and it's gonna be presented by second Lieutenant Jason Long of the Fairfax County Police Department. So I'm gonna let Jason sort of introduce himself, maybe a little quick background on your experience with the police department and what your um, current job entails and and uh, any information you can tell us on pedestrian bicycle safety, including any uh, usable statistics. So um, over to you. Great, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Second Lieutenant Jason Long. Uh, I'm currently the traffic safety section supervisor in the traffic division uh, with the county police department. Um, that position uh, entails me supervising our crash reconstruction unit, uh, which are the detectives that uh, are responsible for in, uh, investigating all fatality, uh, all crashes that result in a fatality uh, or serious injuries, uh, life-threatening injury crashes. Um, I also supervise as part of that unit, uh, not the crash reconstruction unit, but as, uh, as part of the traffic safety section. We have a traffic safety unit um, that acts more like the, uh, what I would say like a crime prevention for the traffic division. They're the uh, officers that will go out to community events. They will provide sort of the ed educational information for uh, traffic safety. We have different um, sort of uh, displays and um, we have something that's called a seatbelt convincer that simulates a, a five mile an hour crash um, to show you that what you feel and just that small of a crash. Um, and it is a pretty jarring kind of rocking back and forth and you say that's only five miles an hour. It, it kind of drives home the, the reason and uh, necessity for wearing a seatbelt. Um, and then we also supervise the motor carrier safety section, which they're involved with uh, inspecting federal motor carrier safety regulations, inspecting uh, motor carriers, uh, commercial motor vehicles, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, I've been with the police department for 23 years. Uh, I've been in this position as a supervisor in the traffic safety section for about nine years. Uh, so I'm pretty familiar with kind of everything we've done over the past two years department-wise in terms of uh, pedestrian safety uh, and, and traffic safety in general. Um, in terms of, you know, if you do, for just some basic crash statistics, currently year to date in Fairfax County, we have um, at least investigated by the Fairfax County Police Department, we have had 11 pedestrian fatalities. That includes the uh, most recent one a couple of nights ago. Um, that was, I believe, up in uh, Reston. I can't remember exactly where that one was, but that was uh, just two nights ago. In um, in 2020, we had 14 pedestrian fatalities. 2019, we had 16 pedestrian fatalities. Um, the one thing that I've noticed, just kind of looking back through some of the crash statistics over this year, last year, and in 2019, is that the number of pedestrian crashes, when compared to the overall number of crashes, has remained constant, uh, which is interesting to me. At 2.3 percent of all uh, crashes are pedestrian crashes. Or involve a pedestrian. Um, so I don't know what that means, but I just thought that was an interesting little statistic that those percentages haven't really changed. They've kind of stayed constant for the past three years. Um, so some of the things that we do for enforcement, uh, obviously uh, we are you know responsible for enforcing laws uh, concerning traffic safety, pedestrian safety. Um, we communicate to the district stations each of the eight police districts. Uh, they have uh, or they did have some. Um, specific officers whose job was just to go out and enforce traffic uh, and to look at hotspots and look at problem areas in that district and to be uh, responsive to that. 
the traffic division also has 32 motor officers. Those are the guys that, uh, and girls that drive motorcycles. Uh, and they are primarily responsible for enforcement of traffic laws as, as well. Um, but we have, we've had some changes over the nine years that I've been here in how we enforce, especially when it comes to pedestrian laws, uh, especially after the last year where the changes in the, in the Virginia code section has made it uh, a little more difficult for us to enforce uh, pedestrian laws regarding pedestrian safety, um, making uh, certain laws uh, secondary offenses, which means we're not allowed to stop uh, pedestrians for crossing outside the crosswalk, which is the number one pedestrian action that's involved in all of our pedestrian fatalities. Over a five year period that that pedestrian action was uh, involved in 45% of all pedestrian fatalities. Uh, so we've sort of uh, moved our focus from. And, and we didn't do much enforcement of that law to begin with what we used that law for. In the past was to stop people that were um, crossing illegally and use that as an, uh, as a time to provide educational material to more, uh, you know, basically issue a warning and have a discussion about. The dangers of why you should cross in the crosswalks and, and cross at intersections when appropriate uh, and the dangers of crossing mid block where drivers aren't expecting. Um, pedestrians and where vehicles tend to have more speed. Uh, we see our biggest. Um, we see our mo most of our fatalities involve. Areas where. Pedestrians and vehicles at. At higher speeds, and I don't mean illegally higher speeds, but just generally higher speeds um, come into conflict. And those areas are mid block where uh, a vehicle is traveling. You know, if it's a speed limit of 45 mile an hour, mile, and, and, and you have someone in the middle of the, of the block uh, crossing, driver's not expecting to see someone there. Uh, that's, that's one of the big uh, components of these fatal crashes that we're seeing. We're also seeing pedestrians crossing against uh, traffic lights. And that is again putting a pedestrian in the way of a potentially uh, fast moving vehicle. So, one of the things that we've sort of changed our focus on in terms of pedestrian enforcement is uh, we're focusing on speed enforcement. We've identified areas in the county where there are a lot of pedestrian crashes, a lot of serious injury and fatal crashes. And um, we do have, we do get uh, some grant money to, to do enforcement in, in the pedestrian safety, and we'll use that grant money. To try and conduct uh, speed enforcement in those areas where uh, those uh, that are higher that we have identified as a higher crash location. The idea is um, hopefully getting the drivers to obviously pay more attention to what they're doing, pay more attention to their speed, um, and slow vehicles down. So, in the uh, if, if there is a crash, hopefully the vehicles aren't moving as fast, um, and and we have drivers that are paying attention. Uh, looking at the side of the road, trying to to look for pedestrians, uh, or maybe that police officer that might be there trying to give them a ticket. Uh, so that's that's one of the changes we've seen or we've tried to implement uh, over the past few years uh, in terms of pedestrian safety. Um, bicyclist safety, uh, it's you know the the bike crashes that we have in the county are uh, a very small percentage of our total crashes. We did have two fatalities this year. Uh, and those two were our first two bicyclist fatalities um, since 2015. Uh, generally speaking, uh, our our county uh, experiences less than 50 uh, bike crashes a year, uh, going back you know uh, the last the last couple of years. So uh, from a from a standpoint of percentage of crashes, it's less than one percent of the crashes that we have um, in the county, and uh, we do we do tend to have uh, less. Uh, bike crashes than we do uh, pedestrian or other ones. The uh, other thing that we are doing, so in a few weeks, uh, two or three weeks, the uh, POG, the Metropolitan Washington Council of Governments Street Smart Campaign will be uh, starting, and that is their annual big campaign they do in the fall uh, for pedestrian safety, and uh, it coincides with the uh, ending of daylight savings time, which I believe is that first weekend in November. Once that happens, is that's when we tend to generally see uh, an uptick in these crashes. So we are going to participate with that program like we do every year. Um, I will be presenting at a best practices workshop for the co Council of Governments focused on law enforcement best practices on how to uh, do enforcement for pedestrian safety 
We will also be producing a roll call video for officers to maybe um, reintroduce them and refamiliarize them with some of the changes in the pedestrian laws uh, and the bicyclist laws and just maybe uh, give them a little refresher in, in some of the pertinent laws pertaining to ped and bike safety uh, in the county. Um, and that's what we have on tap for the fall and winter months. And uh, I guess if you have any questions for me, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, this is Wade Smith of Drainsville. Uh, are is there a is there a cost limit that below which you don't uh, report uh, like the say bicycles? Is there a damage thing that if it's less than a certain dollars you don't record the incident in your database, or are all incidents recorded? It's a great question. It is. Uh, it's a state law. Uh, the only the only crashes that are required to be documented on a crash report are ones that involve damage of greater than fifteen hundred dollars or involve an injury, and that doesn't have to be you know someone going to the hospital. That could be a complaint of neck pain or back pain. Technically, any um, any complaint of injury or any uh, combined damage in the crash of more than fifteen hundred dollars. Yeah, because uh, for bicycle crashes, it, it, you might destroy the bicycle, but isn't worth fifteen hundred dollars. So, or, I guess my question would be: Do you feel like you're not getting all the crashes into the database uh, because of that? What's your experience? Uh, potentially, that that could be. Uh, and we are. Um, I am a part. Um, I I attend the uh, the Fairfax Families for Safe Streets meetings every year, every month, uh, and we do get the near miss data from them as well to try and incorporate into our analysis. We're trying to work with uh, Virginia Tech actually to incorporate a better crash analysis tool. Uh, but I do find that in just in my experience handling bicyclist crashes that if a bike, uh, even if a bicyclist gets knocked over trying to cross, uh, you know, the, in a, in a, say someone's crossing in a crosswalk, the the, uh, the driver is looking to the left at maybe a stop sign looking for traffic and he's not looking back to the right to see the bicyclist come out. Um, even, at, even at a slow speed, uh, you tend to get uh, some complaint of injury. So while the damage might not be there, I mean, generally these crashes are all going to document some sort of injury. So these are the more, you know, the, the crashes that probably have a, have a, an injury involved. Um, and I know there are definitely some people out there with bicycles that are over to fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, I've seen them. Um, there's some pretty nice bikes out there. And in if if you look at the damage of a vehicle, even a scratch bumper now probably costs about eight or nine hundred dollars to replace, so or to fix. Um, but I, I I do think there might be some underreporting there, uh, especially if you're not injured. I, I can see um, people not wanting to wait for the police to show up, and they just drive off and or ride off and, and don't report it. But uh, if if the police are called and come, uh, it's generally because somebody's hurt or something like that. I it, would that be the case? I, th I think that's uh, a, probably a, a majority of those cases. Yes, I think if there was if there were no injury, like I said. Um, some people might not want to wait around for that, uh, just exchange information and move on. Uh, and, and we would not be recalled. We would not be called for that. And if we did document it, it would be documented in a different way, which is again, um, you know, the, if the police show up that we have a documentation that, that the police responded and that even if a report's not written, we would have some sort of um, event number in our dispatch system. Again, we're trying to work with uh, Virginia Tech to use maybe some other data besides just the DMV crash data to get a, a more complete picture of our crash uh, situation. Yeah, I guess that I guess what I was getting at is if there was under reporting, there are more crashes than the data show. But I'm hearing from you, you're you you probably think you're getting most of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. There's probably some underreporting going on. I, it's just hard. It's hard to prove the negative and figure out how much of that underreporting or non-reporting is happening. Lieutenant Long, I have a question for you. Does yes, the police department ever take part in traffic gardens or safety towns, in Fairfax County? Um, so the only traffic garden I am aware of is, uh, and I'm sure there are more, but I know that was something that uh, came out of a statewide uh, program that we were involved in last year with the Virginia Walkability Action Institute. It's something that the Virginia Department of, Department of Health uh, puts on and the police department was involved with that. Um, 
but as far that's that's my extent of knowledge of any of our involvements with traffic gardens. Uh, different stations might have have done some things with their either their crime prevention or their community outreach officers. But as far as I know, with the traffic division, that's the only the only one that I'm aware of is the one that uh, was installed based on some uh, grant money that we that the county received from the Virginia Department of Health last year. So the department doesn't have a, a standard training thing with the elementary schools. No, we do not. And that's, in fact, one of the things that the department used to have years ago, uh, every district station had a school education officer uh, and their, their job was to uh, go to all of the elementary schools and to sort of, we, you know, we have school resource officers in all of the middle and high schools. The school education officer was an officer that was responsible for the elementary schools in that district and they would participate in a lot of these programs, uh, but that unfortunately that officer position was cut several several years ago due to budget issues. Uh, Lieutenant Wong, I got a question for you. Uh, Jeff Anderson representing FAB. Um, thanks for coming to our meeting recently too. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if this came up at the meeting, but I know it's something that we have asked several times and much like the education offices, this was removed probably due to resources, but there was a, uh, um, an aggressive rider reporting database. I, I can't say it's like the family, the Fairfax face safe streets reporting. It was, it was for aggressive driving, um, which may overlap with that or may not. Um, and I don't recall Bruce Wright knew better than I did. Maybe Howard knows, but um, I think I don't know how that was used and how you guys took that information, um, but I know it was ended. Is, has there ever been thought to bring it back, even even simply to have record of someone's bad driving in your right. hands? So I, I believe the program you're referring to, yeah, there was a, an aggressive driver program and this we're probably talking 10 to 15 years ago at this point. Um, yes. It was something where someone could report someone that they, similar to the near miss database that uh, Fairfax Families for Safe Streets is doing. Um, they would report a, a, a location, you know, a time frame, a make model and tag number of a vehicle. Uh, an officer would then, you know, look up the registrator, registered information uh, oh, registered owner's information on that tag number and, and a form letter would be sent to their house saying your vehicle was observed on this date doing this. Um, please drive safe and it would, it would, it would accompany some sort of traffic safety messaging with it. Uh, and you are correct that position was uh, discontinued again due to budget constraints several years ago. Um, there has been some discussion. Uh, there's, there's some issues involved, um, you know, with that program that, you know, Especially in today's society, with uh, the concerns on doxing and swatting and all the other sort of ways to digitally harass people, um, there is some concern that that might open a door to to that sort of harassment, which we don't want to be a part of, obviously. And uh, it's it's very hard to vet these complaints to ensure their validity. Uh, it's very easy for someone who gets uh, upset with someone to maybe. Uh, while this might not be the end all be all sort of, you know, harassment, but this could just be something that could pile on to other things. Uh, so in that aspect, it's not something that we're inclined to take part in. And again, it is very labor intensive, uh, as you can imagine in a county like this. Um, you know, these were all, these aren't just for the, the system, the service wasn't just to report, um, Aggressive drivers towards pedestrians and bicyclists. This was an overall aggressive driver reporting system, and you can imagine how many um, people would have uh, would, would have that. And and just even if there were legitimate complaints on that, it would take one or two officers their full time job to probably track these down and, and send these letters out. And we just don't have the staffing to to do that right now. Um, my suggestion is if, especially, and I, I know people are talking about how a lot of uh, cyclists now have cameras either on their bike or on their, uh, on their helmet, um, for any sort of, um, aggressive driving where, where you see something like that is to make a report to the non-emergency number and make a report of it and have an officer come out to, to investigate it. Um, that would be the best, uh, way I think to, to, uh, to get that documented. 
So, so follow up question. Yeah, I, I actually had that happen once. I was driven off the road and I, didn't, I called and an officer came. Um, and believe it or not, the driver stayed. I, I was surprised. Um, and the officer did a great job of educating the driver. Um, anyway, but the follow up question is so could it be used even just to report into you? Would you like if, if one particular vehicle? tends to show up a lot. I mean, I understand the doxing issue and, and, and everything going on today with, with that, but do, do, do you guys ever look into this kind of data when, how's it presented to you? Because this, does this data help you? Would, you know, you know, does this kind of thing help or not? Um, if there was, it, it's hard to say, we haven't really looked into data like this. Um, because uh, when we get right down to it, we don't, in terms of the traffic problem in this county or the traffic issues that pop up in this county, um, that represents such a small uh, part of it. And most likely those uh, those occurrences are probably happening on roadways or stretches of roadways that we're already aware of with that have issues and we're probably already addressing. Um, but you know, if there was an issue where that, that repeatedly came up, uh, we, we would have ways of, of pulling that up, um, assuming that they're reported to our dispatch center. They, you know, there's a, we can't know about it if no one tells us about it. And even if it's just a lookout where you say, hey, this guy ran me off the road, but I don't want to see, I don't want to wait around for an officer to show up, uh, but I want to report this. Um, there would be ways of us to look at it. Um, and I haven't, uh, we haven't really done that uh, since when I've been here, but that is something I could probably take a look at and, and have um, have one of our analysts just sort of research back through some of our uh, our calls for service and see how that uh, how reliable that data might be. Okay, yeah, I, I I could see collecting of data and not acting on it would might be useful for something, but like you know, I, there was in my old neighborhood there was a stop sign where a lot of cars just blew through it, and mm -hmm. um, you know it's not something I might call the non emergency number about, but. If I could walk over to a website and log it, <clears throat> then I would know. And um, you know, if a teenager was doing it all the time, and you pull them over later, you could see what. Hey, you know, slow down, cut the cut it out. Right, and that's also that's also something that uh, well, you might not call the non emergency number for. That'd be something that you could report to the district station. And each district station has their own website uh, on the county website, and there's there's ways to report things to the commanders and to uh, different entities in the in that station. And that would be something that, uh, you know, that 1 of those traffic officers that I mentioned about earlier would you, know, you, you get a certain number of crashes or not crashes, but complaints about a certain stop sign in a neighborhood. And that's something that that 1 of those traffic officers could go out and, um, and take a look at uh, sit on that stop sign for, uh, for a few days. Uh, and it's amazing that, you know, we all know, we all know it. people in neighborhoods tend to get a little complacent. They drive through the same intersections every day and they and they get a little complacent and, and might need a little reminder that yeah they, they do actually have to stop at that stop sign in the neighborhood. Uh, and it's amazing seeing a police officer sitting at an intersection uh, tends to remind people of that. Uh, this is Jim Klein with uh, Mount Vernon District. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just had a follow up question on your observation about the crosswalks. And most of the serious injuries occurring outside the crosswalk. And I'm glad to hear you focusing more on the speed reduction because there's just not enough crosswalks in our county. You know, just the way land use has developed over time, there's never going to be enough crosswalks. If you live on one side of the street and you want to get to the bus stop on the other, you're not going to walk a mile out of your way to get to the bus stop. You know, so is there anything um, in terms? So that leaves you with sort of mid block crosswalks, which VDOT doesn't like, and it has other issues, but uh, in your years of observing this, are there any other thoughts you might have on how to address this issue and proactively? So, I mean, to your point, you're right. If you have, you know, and the way the code section says, if is that you, it says you shall you know, cross at an intersection unless, you know, or at a crosswalk, unless that crosswalk is unavailable. And then I would say if you had to walk a mile to get to a crosswalk, that would make it somewhat unavailable. Uh, what we're finding, though, and, and this was data, I think it was from um, a five-year period from 2015 to 2019, I believe, uh, was that we had 60 fatal pedestrian crashes 
and 45% of them were, were, were crossing not at an intersection. And, and those weren't, those weren't your neighborhood streets. Those weren't your 25 mile an hour streets. A lot of them were, you know, 40, 45 mile an hour roads, little river turnpike, uh, route 50 up in falls church area, route seven in falls church, route one down in Mount Vernon's area. Uh, and, you know, so those were areas where you have, and generally we see them on areas where you have, um, where you have usually residential on one side of the road and commercial or uh, retail or transit on the other side. And, and on those roads, you're right, that it's a long way to get to a crosswalk, um, but we're seeing people try and risk it and get across. And, um, you know, there've been a few areas where mid block crossings have worked uh, specifically up on route 50. Um, near uh, falls near the Graham Road intersection, there is a there is a sort of a mid block crosswalk, but it's protected by a traffic light. Um, and, and but that was necessary because you again you had a, a shopping center on one side of the road, uh, in between Graham Road and Allen Street. You had a shopping center on one side. You had uh, Monticello Gardens, which is a large uh, townhome and apartment complex on the other side, and people were just going back and forth. Uh, between there, so they had to put that a crosswalk and a traffic light there to, to cross people. Um, you know, again, it's it's the message we try and put out, and this is for drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists, is to be predictable. Um, drivers need to pay attention. Obviously, they need to slow down, but you know, pedestrians need to cross where drivers realistically can expect them to cross, um, and and try and do so in a way to make them visible. Um, that's that's the big thing. And if there is a marked crosswalk somewhere where it makes sense, and if it's mid block, um, then we would obviously support that. Uh, but we would need to see it, you know, somewhere where it it makes sense that it would actually be used by people. Um, and 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 if, if it is used routinely, then again, that makes that people that drive that area uh, mostly, you know, most of the time they they would be conditioned to realize that yes, people are going to cross here. If that makes if that answer your question. Yeah, no, that does that does tremendously. Thank you. And maybe the data that uh, uh, is being collected by uh, Fairfax families for safe streets and you combined with the crash data you have might identify some of those patterns. Yeah, and and we do we do work with uh, and one one officer I forgot to mention that does work uh, in my in unit is we have a dedicated VDOT liaison officer. So he is someone that you know if we see these. Um, these areas that we we can we can sit down with with VDOT and 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 have a discussion with them about what we can do to fix it. Uh, the nice thing about that is that um, engineers don't think like cops and cops don't think like engineers. So uh, engineer will design something and they'll say, well, that's the way it's supposed to be used because that's how we designed it. But then we can be like, well, that's not really how it's being used. This is how it's being used, and and, and we can have that sort of the two different worlds sort of sitting down and and, and trying to come together with. Uh, with uh, solutions and at the same time, cops are like, well, why can't you put all this stuff here and make this and do that? And the engineer like that, that just will never happen because we just can't. Um, so it's it's good to have that relationship with VDOT um, to, to work with us on, on areas like that. Great, thank you. Hmm. Anything further for um, Lieutenant Long? Okay, well, if not, appreciate your time and, and uh, information you provided. Absolutely. And, uh, Thanks for having me. Okay. We're going to move on to the next item. I'm going to ask Beth, um, I know is Tom. Also, I don't see him on the list here. Are you just going to do this solo? I'm here. Oh, you're here. <clears throat> I'm here. There, yeah. Oh, there you are. Okay. All right. We're going to forge ahead then. Take it away. Okay, now can you hear me? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's good. I'm gonna mute myself. Oh, there you go. Oh, Lord. This is uh okay. Hey, WebEx, WebEx changing their uh format, so it gets a little clunky. 
Uh, good evening. To, uh, my name is Beth Ionetta. I'm the Fairfax County Park Authority representative on the committee. I'm joined tonight by Tom McFarland, my counterpart in the Trails uh, Project program with Park Authority. And tonight we're going to talk about the recommended projects that will be funded by the 2020 bond referendum. A little bit of background on what uh, we affectionately call the TDSP. The TDSP stands for the Trail Development Strategy Plan, and it was created to address uh, hold on, I'm on the wrong slide, but that's okay. It was created to address the results of the Park Authority um, needs assessment. One second. Okay. You see the screen now with the bridge? Yeah. Okay. The goal was to add trail links to best increase the availability of trails to um, residents of Fairfax County. The staff has developed a, a multi-step process for evaluating and planning trail projects for inclusion in the board approved annual work plan using eight different criteria based on user value, development impact, and sustainability. Um, this TDSP was created about 12 years ago in about 2009, and so far to date, the money has been allocated to fund about 43 projects representing about 9 million in bond expenditures. The criteria that we use uh, is can see here in the chart, it's based on a scoring system that was established. I will note that the TDSP guidelines are posted on the Park Authority's website on the trails page if you wanna read more in depth on what these factors are. But um, just to give you a brief overview, we look at Factors such as connectivity, service level, stakeholder interest, environmental impact, technical challenge, initial unit cost, sustainability, and maintenance unit costs. Those all get scored and they are tallied up in order to give a point value. Um, once we create the, the scores and take a look at the, at the projects that are that are rise to the top, we then have to go further and and together various staff members to look at other factors in terms of cultural resources and other things like that, or if they've already completed projects, or if um, some projects are no longer viable because other projects took their place. I will note that uh, when Tom and I sat down, we were going through this kind of for the first time, you know, learning the process, and uh, there are a lot of projects that live on this list. And so we had to take some time to really cull through what had been recommended from various stakeholders to see if projects really still uh, made sense to construct. So we took a long time uh, over the last winter trying to work through and um, see what really should be still included in the TDSP for projects. We also received a lot of background uh, in terms of new projects um, since the bond referendum had been advertised. We've got a lot of requests for projects that had not made it in the TDSP. So we had to score a lot of new projects of which we did add. Um, so far right now, the TDSP has approximately 141 trail projects in it that have not been uh, funded yet. And now before I start coughing, I'm gonna turn this over to Tom to give you more details about yeah. the projects and the funding allocation that we have. So, uh, if you look at the last uh, slide, there was something wrong. Um, so the total score is the mat, the possible total score is 21 points. I will tell you that there are no 21 point projects. Uh, as a matter of fact, there's no 20 point projects either. Uh, the highest scoring projects are 19. So there's pluses and minuses for every project when you go through scoring them. A lot of them, um, I'd say maintenance unit cost is one thing that doesn't always score very high. So um, just to let you know kind of where the projects sit, um, there's, there's, no, there's no big bunch of projects all the way at the like, maximum score. Um, plus we have some changes that we'll discuss in a second uh, that we're gonna make uh, to this. So um, the issue here is prioritizing trail projects using the TDSP and the solution is to use the TDSP to select projects for the 2020 bond. Uh, we have proposed 13 projects uh, for 2020 bond funding. 
Uh, funding breaks down basically to $4 million is what we've been allocated uh, for trail projects. Uh, $1.48 million is proposed to be used for uh, funding 2016 bond projects that were only funded for design. Uh, this would complete construction of these uh, three projects that we have that's in that category. The other $2.52 million would be funding design and our construction of new projects. Um, we have also added eight unfunded projects uh, to the list. Those are alternates. If the projects that are in the funded list come in at much less expensive, we're able to get a grant, we're able to get other sources of money, proffers, um, whatever, um, and we don't need that funding and a project has been funded, we can kick it down to one of the eight projects that's on the list because they've also been approved, um, you know, with the understanding that they would be funded if uh, funding became available. So this is the list of projects. Um, this list includes uh, we've us we've updated the cost estimates for all the projects. It turns out that the cost estimates hadn't been updated since 2015, so they were pretty out of date, especially with current pricing. Uh, we've uh, removed the projects completed by park operations and developers or no longer feasible. Um, those were it was probably about 10 or 15 projects uh, that were in that category. Uh, so Staff priority was to fund as many projects through construction as possible. We did fund three design only projects, well, two design only and one study. Um, we don't like doing that because then it's sort of a cumulative effect as in future bonds. So we've, we've kept it to three in this case, and we funded about seven or eight projects through des both design and construction. 13 projects overall, uh, 10 are construction or design and construction, a two are design projects, and one is a feasibility study. All districts have at least one project, and the list includes approximately four and a half miles of trail design and construction. This also includes a wayfinding signage trail marking project to cover Park Authority Trail. So we've been getting a lot of requests about people um, not, find, not finding enough wayfinding or just trail markings in general. Um, and, and getting lost, um, especially at trailheads where trails cross roads and, and that sort of thing. So um, this is something that's been, to be honest, been kicked down the road for quite a long time. Uh, we did do uh, a marking effort for the Cross County Trail when that uh, came about in 2006. And I don't think we've bought two new markings for even for the Cross County Trail since then. As a matter of fact, we didn't because I still have the same set of stickers I had from 2006. So um, we, we need to do something about it. $50,000, I don't know if that's enough. It's a start though, to get us an idea of what we wanna do, something that's sustainable. Um, a lot of our markings get vandalized, uh, removed or set on fire or any number of things. Um, so we need something that's sustainable, that's relatively inexpensive and that we can distribute through the whole 330 miles of trail. Uh, again, uh, the list here includes about $3 million in design and construction and $1 million uh, in design only. So unfunded projects, there's eight unfunded projects. Um, four are would be construction and four would be uh, design only. Construction projects, um, there is the pavement run project up in uh, Drainsville, and then three uh, Rabbit Branch or Royal Lake projects. Um, and then four projects uh, that are unfunded, uh, Long Branch and Justice Park, and two other Royal Lake projects. It's uh, approximately $2.4 million in construction and uh, $1.1 million in design only. And I, I will add that we did add the rabbit branch trail projects because of the 1 million dollars that was allocated through the governor's budget um, that was specifically for uh, Royal Lake. And so we wanted to make sure if we get tasked with that effort that we're able to move those projects forward um, since that funding was secured through the governor's budget. 
Yeah, that, and that's why they're on the unfunded list because if we get that funding, they can be funded and they've already been pre-approved as a, being part of our work plan. And so we can go forward, you know, immediately without having to go back and do more board items or, or anything like that. Um, I would also say that uh, overall, uh, in addition to removing the 14 or 15 projects, we've probably added, I would say, at least 35 projects um, in the past year and a half in preparation of the 2020 bond. Uh, many, many projects, many new projects. Um, so for the few that we lost, we added probably three times as many. Um, so that's how we get up to 100, uh, 141, almost 150. It was 150 and now it's about 141. Um, so things we want to do uh, going forward for 2024. Oops, go back um, so we're looking at the TDS. We both looked at the TDSB quite a bit in the past year. And uh, we found there are things that can be improved. I mean, considerably. There's quite a few things that we can improve. So, um, and, and technical things, but then also in the selection criteria as well. Uh, there's three things we would like to add uh, before we start choosing 2024 bond projects that we think are important that also go with the uh, one Fairfax and, and other initiatives uh, for the county as well. And uh, three of those, the three highlights that we're looking at right now are equity and vulnerability. Um, if we can access uh, use data or heat map data, like the streetlights data uh, for our trails, that would be huge because we have no use information for any of our trails. We don't do trail counts; they're too expensive. Uh, we don't have we don't have any way of knowing how our trails are actually used. Um, and I would like to change that. I would like to quantify that somehow. And I think that would reveal areas that we didn't even know were hotspots uh, for trail use. And then those should be a priority. I mean, if, if that trail is serving a lot of people, it, it should be a priority, but we don't know that right now. Um, and then the last one being accessibility. Um, and by accessibility, I, I do mean ADA. Um, that's it. Uh, so our schedule here, uh, we presented uh, to the board on uh, in September as a proposed list. Uh, we actually had a committee meeting tonight and the board will meet in about two weeks for approving the uh, final uh, list as it was shown here. And then it'll be added to the 2022 work plan. And then from there, we'll start allocating uh, staff as we have staff available to start projects. About it. So that's what we have so far. And uh, Jim, I see your hand up. Yeah, uh, thank you guys. Excited to see all these, even though we're making slow progress, that we're making progress. Um, do you have the uh, TDSP score for each of the 13 that you're moving forward? Um, not on me. Um, <laughs> Not mm -hmm. not in presentation form. No, I don't. So I, is there I, like so these, is it could it be a safe assumption that these thirteen are the top thirteen? <clears throat> yes. No. Yeah, well, not well, not one hundred percent. No, I mean I can't say that every single one was a the highest scoring project. There are some things that we looked at. I think there was a couple of districts where the higher scoring project had some major unknowns uh, to it, um, things like uh, uh, stormwater projects that were to uh, start occurring in the near future. And so we want to hold off on those until those things are done. Um, so no, they're not always the highest scoring project, but generally speaking, uh, that that was our main selection criteria to start with was we picked the top five uh, from every district, and that was our initial list, uh, was that top five list, and then we boiled it down to like the top three. 
And then we just kind of kept going from there until we had a list that was $4 million. Yeah, I would just add that every district has needs and so, um, but not every project scores equally. And so, um, like Tom was saying, we take the scores as, as the top is the 1st step. And then we kind of look at geographics as well as other factors. Um, there are some projects that if we did, you know, the, if we only did the top scoring projects, they would take the entire bond project. You know, we'd have 1 project to share. So we do have to kind of look at it in terms of a di distribution of where they are and where we can get um, sort of the best bang for the little money that we do get every four years. So um, we have sort of that those factors to take into consideration before we present the final list. Okay, thanks. Hey, we do we do hope that um, using more criteria for um, dis disadvantaged areas and as well as looking at um, not just distance to um, like a service area of communities that that um, are near it, but more of like distances to park entrances. So right now we just like look at where the trail is located and how many people are nearby sort of as the crow flies. We would do more of detailed uh, um, analysis of you know, park entrances and, and then how many it serves from that. So we're trying to get more um, detailed in our analysis. Routing, using routing instead of just drawing a circle around a, an access point, which is uh, quite generic. I mean, we do sort of factor in if there is a major obstruction, like 95 or something between where the trail is and where the people live, obviously we wouldn't just count that. but. We, we also don't really look at any form of like routing and, uh, and we would like to do that. Now, like, this is 1 of us, what we were saying, you know, we didn't have any trail data. Uh, GIS data, for example, until like 2009, 2010. So this is really, we're still working on like the 1st version of GIS data for trails in the park authority. Um, it's, it's not that old. So there are a lot of things that we can look at now that we couldn't look at even five years ago. And we have a whole GIS department now that can help us with that, with those geo analysis uh, that we didn't have um, just a couple of years ago. So um, we're hoping that we can get a, a lot more specific with our, our uh, criteria and, and a lot more informed uh, with some of the information that we can get. Hey. Tom, Beth, this is Jeff Anderson. Um, Tom, good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. Um, yeah. So, uh, I was your comment about not having any data um, kind of piqued my interest. Um, I assume you're aware of Strava and their data collection and heat maps. Um, I do know they sell that commercially. Um, you go look at it now, and it's basically a big orange blob for some trails that you know are very popular but i i think that might be worth looking at um it may not be cost effective but um i don't know what kind of offering they have it might be just worthwhile to see what's there i, I would suggest go over there and look at it um i know we regularly tap into that particularly when a trail is being considered fab will look at it and and the, the goat paths sometimes tell us that there's a trail need um, you know, no sidewalk or trail, but there's activity. Um, so, you know, that's all driven off of users having, you know, a GPS device either on their arm or on their bike. Um, but, you know, there is there is a counter, a bike counter that Fairfax County DOT has, a portable one. I just saw it in Reston the other day. Um, that may be something you need to borrow <laughs> um, or invest in. Um, have you considered actually with all new projects, including, um, some sort of trail counter? I know when we lobbied for the I 66 trail, I, I, I random, I, I randomly walked over to the, one of the engineers. During all those hearings and I said, Hey, can we get some counters on this trail? Because that's what's in Arlington. And he looked at me and said, he said, great idea. Why don't we do that? And now we have eight or nine counters that are going to be installed when the. I-66 trail is going in, um, and we're actually now working with VDOT and trying to figure out where those should be placed. So there's a lot of opportunity here, I think, particularly on new trails. You know, I would put it in the budget. I don't know how much they are, but um, data can be king and help you guys. 
Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with you. Um, one thing I will note is that uh, I think I think trail counters and, and Tom can correct me if I'm wrong work as long as you have a very controlled entrance or not. And a lot of our trails have multiple points of access and we have a very large inventory of trails. Um, I think between Arlington has like 20 miles of trails and we have 350 miles of trail. And that becomes very difficult uh, to do spot counting. Um, and so we're, we were really hopeful that the work through Active Fairfax with the heat map and the data that they're using for that, we can then easily apply. Um, since they're taking it as part of a whole county, a whole county wide look, and then we can derive from that. But uh, we're going to definitely look into more technology that we've had avail available to us that we've had that we haven't had in the past. Yeah, uh, Tom, do you want to add anything to that? Well, you know, as you're saying, investing. The problem is we don't have money to invest. I'm trying to squeeze every single mile I can out of the, the meager amount of money that we get, which is, uh, you know. A, Hundreds of a percent of the money that somebody like FC dot has, uh, I have 2Million dollars for the next 5 years. Basically, after I take out the money for the projects that I'm already committed to building. Uh, it's it, you know, it, it's, we just don't have the, the funds. Um, I don't even know if we're allowed to spend bond money on that. I would even, I would have to look at that. And our general fund money is basically non existent. As we've been, you know, budget cut to death over the past 10 years. Um, so that's, that's the real problem is, is allocating funding. To do these things, and then to have the staff to actually collect the data and process it. It's something we didn't have, like I said, we didn't have a GIS department until like 3 years ago. Um, so now, because of them, we have, we have an opportunity. I know I was exchanging emails with the streetlights people uh, a couple of months ago, and they seemed like they had good information. But again, it's about it's about paying for the data. You know, we want it in a certain form. Uh, we want it where it's been most useful for us. Um, and uh, I just don't know enough about it right now. But as Beth was saying that, you know, we know they're collecting this data uh, for the for the active Fairfax uh, work. And, you know, hopefully maybe we can get something from that. Yeah, well, I just, I just know that you said you. You don't know who's using how many people are using your trails. So. Um, we don't count it. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, it's. I, I understand the budget, um, but it's also 1 of those things where. You can use that data. To get more money if you're finding a particular. Park or something, or, you know, if you can show usage. Um, that may help you. Uh, well, so I don't think we're going to get more money, but I think we can spend the money in the right place. Yeah. I think we're going to get the money that we get. Um, uh, I mean, that, that's the way the bonds work, but you know, we can spend it more wisely. And, that, and that's the whole point of all of this. And it's the whole point of the TDSP to yeah. know where to spend the money. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what a portable counter would go for. Um, but certainly that may be something to look at that you could then use it, you know, when you needed to, um, versus it would also, it would also have to work in remote locations under tree canopies and basically be a drunk guy with a baseball bat proof. There, there was, a, them, yeah, or and fireproof so, because did, people like burning things. Uh, wasn't there a counter installed out at Fountainhead? There was a there was a there was a, a counter installed at Fountainhead. Mm -hmm. um, I believe more. Uh, that's I believe that was Moore's counter that was yeah out there for a temporary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, they stuck it out, and it went. It was out in the middle of the the, the trail. So, um, I think that you know that ability exists. Anyway, I and just trying to help share a solution to get more data. Um, but, Tom, yeah. yeah. As as part of the the budget adjustments and, and the costs of these projects, are you, is adjusting the park or the trail systems maintenance budget even part of the conversation, or is that just a bridge too far? Uh, the maintenance budget is completely separate from from what we're doing. Uh, this is not 
This is not maintenance. Maintenance is, is general. I don't understand fund. that, but you're adding facilities to a existing thing. Um, you mean the cost of maintenance? Yes, the cost of maintenance is actually one one in, or two of the factors um, in, in the TDSP. It's actually counted twice because the sustainability and then maintenance unit cost are both scorable items. Plus, every project that we have and this and this list is um, is done with the our park operations team. So we we talk to them, we show them what we're doing, what we're planning on doing, and if they have any concerns about the cost of something or how maintainable it's going to be, you know, we take that we take that quite seriously. If they're concerned at all, um, you know, we we don't want to we don't want to burden I don't want to burden them with anything that they can't maintain. So their budget okay. isn't really adjusted, but they have the opportunity to to weigh in on it. Yes. Okay. I have, there's no way I can't adjust their budget. I don't know who even adjusts their budget. And it's, like I said, it's general fund money that comes from the county. I, so I, I understand, Tom. I just want to make. I just want to highlight the fact that adjusting maintenance budgets is so seldom part of the conversation. You know, and there's it's so underfunded right. in um, in our region. So that's a. Well, one of the conversations that we had with Park Ops when we were reviewing projects was that um, we, we kind of get an insight from them as to we're having to replace storm dust over and over again, and it's costing us X amount of money. And we really probably, and we know we get a lot of trail uses out of this part. We really probably should pave it because at some point you just can't, you just, you, you're, you're, the user value, the user level is going up so high that it's creating more damage because it's muddy all the time. And so it's really becoming a factor of environmental damage versus maintenance costs to constantly um, fix trails and stream valleys versus if you pave it, you give it a longer life use, you know, that, that sort of question. So we do have those conversations with them when we, when we know that um, it's a high use trail that's, that's getting repeated repetitive maintenance that needs to um, get moved up to a higher level. And I know um, Bob Cosgrove is telling us we're running into public comment time. So if you guys have any other questions, just uh, reach out to Tom and I. Um, as he was saying, the park board will finalize um, their the list for approval at the end of October. So if you have any questions, uh, I know Howard, you sent me some questions. I'll follow up with you on those those two projects, and uh, we'll get back to you. Okay, thank you, Beth, and thank Thanks you, so Tom. That was very very informative, and the the input from uh, Jeff and. Carl, likewise. Okay, we have to pause here in our agenda uh, presentation items because we're under the public comment time. We have three guests who have logged in, um, Amy Carley and Sheila Dunheimer. And Sheila had contacted us ahead of time, you know, with, a, with an agenda item that she wanted to speak. So I'm gonna turn it over to Sheila at this time to let her start uh, this public comment time and we'll, see how long it goes and if there's time left over afterwards we'll go back to the agenda sheila i think you're on mute sheila You know, there used to be a way for me to mute and unmute people for them, but apparently I cannot do that anymore. Okay, let me see if I can. Hang on. All I can do now is request that they unmute themselves, which is not nearly as useful. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I don't know if I can share my screen with you guys. If that could be done. Um, try now. 
has made you the presenter. Can you see it now? No. No? Oh, there, share. Just a second. That one? Yeah, I think so. There. Okay. Can you see this now? Yep. Great. Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you for your um, allowing me to speak tonight, and I'll try to be really quick through all of this. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to uh, bring up and uh, hope that the committee would consider these recommendations that align with um, you know, the agenda items tonight, looking at uh, Active Fairfax and the recent survey and input and recommendations from um, citizens and um, then also um, looking at environmental and health impacts. So the first recommendation is uh, existing and new trails need to be scrutinized for their environmental impacts especially in our stream valleys. And I know, um, you know, just three, just before me talking about the cost of trying to maintain, you know, certainly the trails in the uh, stream valleys that, um, you know, it's hard to do. And, you know, there are just a lot of considerations there. Um, you know, the, the second thing is recommendation number two is that the trails committee develop a statement requesting that Northern Virginia Soil and Water Conservation District be required to consider and evaluate possible impacts to nearby parkland and trails as they develop and look at alternatives regarding appropriate land use and development of con uh, conservation plans. And so, um, you know, this uh, ties in with the environmental perspective as far as also when we go through the slides here, you'll see that it could impact transportation safety as well. Um, so in particular, looking at the environmental and transportation, um, I, I looked at the survey that was uh, on the web and actually input some comments. And one thing that um, I became aware of was that there was a, a bike trail that was proposed from Hunter Mill Road that would go into the Hunters Valley Association neighborhood so it would go along Wickens Road, and then it would go Walter Thompson, ends in a cul-de-sac there. And so I guess they were proposing that then that, that bike trail would then access the difficult run Stream Valley Park at that point. And so, um, I, you know, in, retro, in perspective of considering the Stream Valleys, you know, difficult run Stream Valley is a resource protected area. And um, so I was surprised that, uh, you know, as far as the survey goes, this wasn't a new suggested suggestion. It was already a solid line. It doesn't appear in the current bike maps, but it looks like it had been vetted and was like getting closer to, to becoming maybe, a, a, you know, present in the next uh, rendition of it. And so I'm hoping that this will be reconsidered um, you know, for the fact that it doesn't it doesn't connect into any FCPA maintained public trails at that point, and there are also uh, is a parallel existing parallel bike path that's on Hunters Valley Road that leads to public parking there, you know, public access, the new public bridge that's there to get across Difficult Run to get to the CCT. And um, the other considerations, which would be just overall ones, uh, I guess in general, evaluating the new suggestions that would be coming in is that in our situation, Wickens Road uh, is not a through street. It's the only ingress and egress into the 100, 100 Mill Road for 110 residential properties. And um, is the impact to the neighborhood here that we are an equestrian neighborhood. So, you know, oftentimes there are um, vehicles that are parked on, along the side of the road that are larger vehicles, there are trucks, there are um, horse trailers and things like that. Um, and we have some uh, pretty good curves with um, line of sight problems. So you have limited sight distance, no paved shoulders or sidewalks, on-street parking, frequent driveways. You have intersecting private bridle trails 
that would cause sometimes sudden and unexpected hazards with horses and dogs, you know, that might be possibly off, off leash. And, you know, the big point is that this would end in a termini that's, you know, a, a, a cul-de-sac, which is supposed to be for, you know, turning vehicles around. And, you know, when it's, when you've got a trail like this, then, you know, it would just, it, it would invite people to come and park there and would, you know, reduce that function. So those are some of the, the things, hopefully, that will be considered as you're looking at the new trails. And then secondly, the other piece that was a recommendation for the um, in, uh, outreach to Northern Virginia soil and water is that there's a current um, land use uh, project that's going on near the Vale Road uh, crosswalk and uh, the CCT uh, um, trail as it goes there. And um, the Northern Virginia soil and water is reviewing a, uh, a, a pasture use for this area, for an area that is in RPA and floodplain and had been abandoned for that type of use back in 2011. So there's a lot of environmental issues with this whole project and current code compliance and investigations and things like that. But as we were investigating this whole project, what was interesting, this is the, the plan drawn by Northern Virginia Soil and Water, is that this is the proposed pasture area fenced in but this line from Jade, the green line, shows the path of the CCT versus, you know, if you are familiar with this area, this is the Girl Scout um, Camp Crowell on this side, and the path pretty much just mirrors that old property line there. So, um, you know, what I did was to take the, this proposed line that's there and then assuming uh, based on our deeds uh, from Hunters Valley Association um, that are out there and other property owners in the valley that were existing bridal trail easements. I think the average width is about 20 feet. So, you know, saying that that's the middle of the path, then you've got, you know, 10 feet there and 10 feet the other way. So it's a, a completely different footprint than what exists. And, you know, what it probably does is skirt around, you know, was meant to skirt around the existing wetlands that are in uh, the Girl Scout camp right now. There are a lot of, and this is what the new pasture is looking like now, with a lot of manure, it's flooding, you know, gates uh, or fencing that's not normally recommended for wildlife habitat uh, because of concerns about the trail. You know, the trail in this area has a lot of problems, you know, with exposed roots and things like that. With this project, there's been a new entrance that's been added to a Vale Road and a paved, uncommitted paved driveway there. So you have this confluence of, you know, this private road into the Girl Scout camp that has buses. Now you have a new entrance there um, that's a much more intense use than it's ever had with um, farm vehicles that are extended length, you know, turning, you've got the CCT trail crosswalk there, you've got turning lanes, you've got one of two entrances into Berryland, which is another subdivision over there. So, you know, you have just a lot of issues that were, were not considered um, as part of this Northern Virginia soil and water plan. And, you know, so not only looking at the CCT footprint of where it is on on the property line with the camp, also as it um, as it parallels this area along Vale Road, you'll see that um, you know it just has very um, the the footprint there is not very wide, and this certainly is an area where you have a, a truly a shared use you know trail with horses, equestrian, and bicyclists. And so, you know, this whole area should be reevaluated for the current standards for a shared path of like 10 foot wide and then the two foot uh, clear zone on either side. So um, citizens were, were asking that Northern Virginia, they supposedly have a nine step process that they follow that's uh, with the National Resource Conservation with USDA that um, they consider more the natural resources and um, the alternatives that might be out there. 
you know, we have in our area, um, the, the bridge there always has been an open classroom. During the pandemic, we had, um, you know, it was great opportunity. Some of the programs the, uh, through the park authority where they're utilizing um, information uh, that's been developed by Fairfax County stormwater and the school system. You know, we've got these boxwood wood, um, turtles that are on the path right in that area. But, you know, and, and trails are certainly an educational um, aspect to all of them. But, you know, if we allow things like this to happen, you know, what's the message that Fairfax County and Northern Virginia Soil and Water are really sending if, um, you know, we're allowing, um, you know, this visual message, um, you know, to get across to them. So hopefully, you know, the, the big recommendation is um, outreach to um, Northern Virginia Soil and Water. And I don't know if that would be through the uh, development planning committee recommendations to the Board of Supervisors or um, how that um, process could be instituted, but I think it would be very helpful. And, you know, overall, uh, a review of the actual easement deeds in this area, because I think, you know, especially where there is problems with the conditions of the path and um, maybe safety issues, um, you know, might be a good exercise to go back and actually look at the the, the deeds to see if they're, you know, where it, the path currently is versus where it could be uh, in situations like this, you know, we have an opportunity to kind of write, write everything. So thank you for listening. Is anybody there? Uh, yeah, Sheila, thank you for bringing this to the committee's attention. Uh, you know, I think there's, you know, many avenues that you and your fellow res residents in Hunter Valley have to, to work this issue. I mean, certainly starting with the supervisor office, and this might be one of those areas that sort of overlaps Hunter Mill and Sully. I'm not sure exactly where that line is out there, but and uh, certainly any development has to go through the planning commission and the district's land use committees and so forth. So there's, those are, those are probably the best pressure points to, you know, obtain the goals you sort of set out here. So do you not think that um, it would be something of interest to the trails committee as a policy statement? Because similar to, I think, what um, we found happened, you know, with the demolition of the Gabrielson Bridge that, you know, that happened with no planned replacement because, you know, the outreach, I think, to the trails committee and uh, for input was very late in the game. And so I guess citizens were hoping that, you know, it was an example of something like this, that maybe it's more of a policy recommendation from the trails committee. Um, either to the Board of Supervisors or to Northern Virginia Soil and Water, um, if it's a recommendation or a request that, um, you know, you be incorporated uh, or the FCPA be incorporated or somebody formally within the review process before they recommend a plan to be approved by their board. Okay, well, can you make your slides available to uh, me to share with the committee? Because, you know, we have to, as a committee, have to have as much information as we can before we make a recommendation to the chairman of the board and the rest of the board, which is our function. And uh, especially if it pertains to a policy issue of the county. So uh, we want to be a little more educated on this. So could you make this presentation available so I can share it with the committee and we can uh, deliberate on it? Uh, in the interim between now and the next meeting? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. Can uh, can you say, I mean, it's not clear to me what you're asking for. Uh, you pointed out issues, but I, I'm not sure what you're, what you're asking uh, should be done. Well, I think um, it's, if you go back to this one slide and you see, and you see the plan that was uh, drawn up, even though that it's very clear that the um, 
the path, the CCT, um, as it's mapped here versus even the reality of where it exists, that there's a disconnect there in that information. And so with no requirement of any surveys of the land, um, you know, or even a review of the, the deeds, if Northern Virginia is, I think their position was that this was kind of out of their scope when um, citizens are trying to say that any development that impacts a transportation um, mode, which certainly this is a major shared use path, should be part of the development consideration. And so I guess it's a recommendation to widen that scope of, um, you know, evaluation if a project is, uh, might impact an existing or potential trail. You're, you're talking about the soil and water conservation plan. Yes, yeah. yes. Okay. So they develop conservation plans, and a lot of times these plans then are bases for a lot of other permits. So even though they don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have any really enforcement capability, is you know, they're more recommendations, still an approved plan by their board is the basis for um, a lot of other permits and land uh, development and land use. And so if they're making recommendations of land use and not considering um, the impact of their recommendations on any nearby adjacent trails, then, you know, there's a disconnect there. So you're saying the cross county trail is affected by this um, and that needs to be considered. I'm trying to understand what, yes, what you're definitely. suggesting needs to be done. Yes, definitely in this situation, the cross county trail is uh, being impacted by, by this. And so um, it would, one recommendation would be for the uh, FCPA I guess um, to reevaluate the deeds, the, the easement deeds, particularly in this area, um, to look to see what the footprint is, because there's a potential to not only increase the um, safety of the trail portion that parallels Vale Road to get to the crosswalk, um, depending on what the actual footprint is, as well as there are a lot of existing trail condition issues because of the wetlands there, that if the easement really is further east and for whatever reason, previous fencing or whatever has prevented that um, from being where it could be, now would be the opportunity to look at that and possibly realign the trail out of the wetlands um, and would uh, address a number of issues in that area. Well, we have the, the Park Authority folks on. Beth, do you know anything about this? Um, I, I I will say it's hard to read the detail on the screen. And so um, I think if you get us more information, we can try to see what's going on. From what I understand, there's a development happening on this property and you're concerned about the impacts to the adjacent Cross County Trail, if I'm paraphrasing you correctly. Um, I don't know what case it is, but I, you know, I can, I can look into it some more with some, and get some more information. I can try to understand uh, further what the issue is. Yes, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. And I will say um, on your first point about the active Fairfax plan, none of the lines that have been recommended for trails have been evaluated in any shape or form by staff. As far as I know, and um, I, I will punt that to FCDOT to talk about their map for active Fairfax, because um, we've getting a lot of calls about the map and what it means. Um, it's, it's way early in the process, as I understand, and nothing has been evaluated yet. So um, if they want to speak to that. That would be helpful. Hey, yeah, um, I think that's. That's. That 
pretty well sums it up, Beth, actually. Um, but yeah, it, it, the plan is very early in this development. Um, the goal of the online um, survey uh, tool was to sort of get um, you know, the citizen input for places that we might not have thought to be able to look on our own, um, you know, and, and is to also build upon previous iterations of biker trail plans um, that the county had done, um, you know, some time ago. So nothing, as Beth said, nothing on that map is like ready to be built or anything like that. Everything is still um, still to be evaluated um, at later stages of the planning process. And, and these are definitely things that are going to be considered, you know, um, obviously impacts on on communities, uh, positive and negative, um, you know, um, and wetlands impacts, those sorts of things. And, you know, um, we, we certainly want to take as comprehensive a look as possible um, when doing um, the, the active Fairfax plan, because um, that's what's going to be the guiding document um, for the future once we have it developed. Yeah, I would just recommend stay in, in touch with the Active Fairfax project and um, when they get to a point where they're ready to get feedback again on recommendations that have been made, um, certainly keep an eye out for that as well. But um, there's there's more to come <laughs> for just right now. There are lines on a page and that's about as much weight as they carry um, as far as I understand it. Okay, thank you. I mean, that was really good to consolidate. I, get, I think that last pass, if I read it correctly, was to consolidate a lot of different um, plans, as you had said, but it was very, um, very nice to have that interactive capability to click and make comments and things like that. So I just want to give you that feedback. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we started about 10 minutes late. We're at nine o'clock now. Um, we could go another nine minutes or so. Uh, I know we have one other item. Uh, if if you're done, Sheila, I don't know if you have any more. You go ahead. This would be your time. We're still in the public comment period. But uh, if you can send me those slides and we can get them out to everybody else and just take a look at this and try to uh, grasp the uh, essentials. So, but if if you are done, then we'll move back to the other items on the committee. So you tell me, Sheila, are you... Any other comments though, on this item? No, I definitely appreciate the time you guys have given me tonight and I will summarize all this and, and send it forward. So thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Jim, we had you down for 20 minutes and we only have about yeah. eight minutes. Let me take maybe two minutes. All right, jump in so, then. So I put in the chat, uh, a feeble attempt at giving you the link to the uh, October 5th uh, board meeting. And uh, on there is Supervisor Faust's board matter, which was actually, uh, I believe, supported unanimously and, and sponsored by maybe eight or nine others. Uh, and uh, what it is is um, great. Uh, they directed essentially staff to look at. Um, uh, let me just get down here. Look at sort of not just the TPP projects, but other unfunded projects uh, over to be considered. Maybe I'm trying to read something here. The board matter made a case. Uh, let me keep going here. Sorry. Dave, can you let him share the screen so we can see what he's talking about this letter, this board action? It may be a little challenging. <laughs> Technology. <laughs> Technology at its finest. Yeah. David's already pulled off a few coups tonight, so maybe he can get you to share this port Let's item. See. I hadn't imagined that I'd be able to do that in two minutes, but. Uh... Um, well, I did make you the presenter, so um, you should have a share. Well, so all I can do is I'm having the same problem that. Um, uh, the earlier Fairfax, uh, I'm going to lose the whole meeting if I do that. <laughs> so let me uh, not. Would you like to? You want to hold this I, open I until just, next month? Yeah, I can, or I can just suggest you go to the link. Oh, I can't even get off here. 
I'm seeing uh, in the website or just go to the October 5th uh, Board of Supervisors uh, video recording. It's about an hour, 35 minute in, and it's Supervisor Faust's um, board matter that was signed on by, I think, nearly all the supervisors except maybe one. Uh, what they're asking is to compile a list of previously identified and currently unfunded pedestrian and bike projects that would contribute to pedestrian and bike access and or safety and that can be commenced as soon as funding is identified. Recommend criteria for immediate evaluation of projects to be funded with additional funding in fiscal year 2022 and identify additional potential funding options for allocation to these pedestrian bike projects. And what they're specifically uh, giving out is uh, a goal of 100 million in funding 2023 through 2027 for projects that are not on the TPP. So this is probably something that the uh, Fairfax County DOT staff is going to be uh, swimming around trying to trying to come up with some recommendations. But uh, I would say that we should all be aware of this. Uh, I think they want to do this by the next transportation committee meeting, which I'm not sure exactly when that is, maybe three months from September 28th, whatever that is. So uh, I just became aware of this maybe a week ago or less than a week ago. And I, I think it would be worth our having a conversation about this in terms of how we can't really uh, advise Fairfax County DOT staff, but you could certainly, for those of you in uh, representing districts could certainly uh, get familiar with it and then raise a conversation with your, your uh, supervisor uh, about it. I, and I don't know, David, if you have any other insights into that board matter, if it's gotten down to you guys yet or not, but it's a, uh, it's a potentially a tremendous opportunity to get beyond the projects, the unfunded projects on the TPP, which will be there forever and to actually get some systematic safety improvements for pedestrian and bicycle uh, throughout the county. I, I think it's a great opportunity. So I, I wanted to make people aware of it. And that's pretty much all I had to say. Okay. Thank yes, you. and we get to start feverishly working on these lists. Yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah, Lauren, I I, this is Beth. I've got one question. Um, so here, Park Authority was left out <laughs> of this <laughs> consideration yet again. And um, I don't know who's working on that primarily, but um, if there's a possibility where we have um, any unfunded projects that could be considered that serve a bigger purpose than just, you know, local park access, is that something that we can work with DOT on to, to you know, make recommendations? But it seems they made it very, very focused to only the TPP and not the global active Fairfax network. One thing I think they did specifically say that they needed to go beyond the TPP for the 100 million over the five year budgeting period, which I thought to be pretty good comment. So it seems like any things like that could fit in, especially if it was part of the criteria that the county staff are going to come up with. <laughs> so, yeah, one big problem we're having right now is um, fair weather crossings and ADA. And so that's a huge, huge countywide problem that speaks to not only equity, but also um, countywide. And so it would really add better connectivity to a lot of our trails, but we don't have enough funding to tackle that. And so um, there's things like that that we were kind of hoping we could put forward as recommendations for consideration. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, it certainly is a good idea. I don't know the language of the board matter well enough to say if like what degree of flexibility we would have in something like that. Um, but I think it's something that would be worth exploring um, if we if we can certainly. If there's a point person over there, could you let me know and uh, hopefully I can kind of coordinate with them. Yeah, I'll have to find out who that would be. Okay, well, thank you, Jim, for bringing that up. And, you know, if everybody can sort of go into that thing, or uh, if I can find another copy of that board item, it, it may be attached to the agenda or the post meeting thing. Take a look at it. Uh, it was uh, unanimous, except for one. No, it was <laughs> fully unanimous. It ended up being the vote was fully unanimous. Fully unanimous. Okay. And it, it, it looks like it's an attempt to get some low hanging fruit and to, you know, jumpstart things because, as you know, we lost money, you know, in all the gyrations with the state government and pandemic relief and this and that, that now they, they, the Board of Supervisors is hoping to 
jumpstart some of this and maybe get things moving forward, you know, maybe in anticipation of the active Fairfax plan and it may even provide some relief for the park authority as, as Beth is pointing out that they're a part of the inner rural network. So please take a look at that and I think we can, you know, perhaps <clears throat> discuss it again next month uh, with a little more knowledge behind us. Absolutely, thank you. I think December 14th is the next board transportation subcommittee meeting. Okay. Just to give you a target. Speaking of target dates uh, for the next meeting, if, if committee members could have their agenda items into me by the 27th of October for the 10th of November meeting, that would be great. Is there any other items to come before the board at this time? We're not going to have time for a staff report this this month unless we stay till ten o'clock. So, <laughs> any other items? If not, I was I thought it was a very productive meeting, and uh, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. Are there any objections to adjourning? Hearing none, the meeting stands adjourned at 9 10 p.m. Thank you all. Great. Thanks, Bob.